We we now bring in Kaylor Hodges and our friends from the USL show. Kaylor, where are you? This is a new environment that we are seeing you in. Uh, this is my school uh, office, which is an absolute mess because we're preparing for you know Friday Night Lights, the high school football, which yeah, man. everything is an absolute disaster around here. But that's okay. <laughs> no, no, it is it is it is not a disaster if you are working your way forward. To, hey. to get everything prepared for Friday night football. I know how it is in the AHSAA. I, I'm, on, I'm right there with you. I'm a state over in an hour ahead. I know what's going yeah. on. I, I, I know what's go, what goes on with Hoover and Vestavia and Oak Mountain and all those folks. And yep. uh, all those folks. So, no, trust me. I know what's going on there, sir. I'm all about it. We don't have that kind of money, though. We're not, we're not that kind of. Hey, that's all right. We don't need money. We have heart. <laughs> which is also what we say about the USL versus MLS. You know what I mean? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Uh, the, re- the reason that we, we bring you in and we bring you and Morrissey in the USL show in is that we like to talk about stuff. That's the official term. Yeah. The life in USL championship. Uh, first off, let's go big match last night. Big result for Memphis 901 as they were down. And then by the end of the evening, they were not. So no. big win for 901, a loss for Tampa at one of the worst possible times. Yeah, you know, it was a massive win for Memphis, which doesn't come without controversy at the very end mm-hmm. because there is a real shout of it being offside uh, when that sec, when that, well, I guess third shot was put on goal because Malloy gets a penalty. It's saved by Sparrow, great save. The next shot goes off target. He hits the post from basically the penalty spot again. And then the follow-up, you can say that the person who took the shot, and I'm blanking on who it was off the top of my head, was offside. But they're calling it an own goal by Lasso. But I think a lot of a lot of Tampa Bay fans are saying the shot was offside. It should never happen anyway. Even so, you know, this is – this is a uh, Tampa Bay that was without their head coach due to personal reasons. Nikki law was not there who, if you're like Nikki law, yeah. Um, old coach, uh, is over at Barnsley now, uh, Neil Collins. So, you know, new coach comes in and then a little bit of like, okay, now our other coach isn't here. So I think a lot of Tampa Bay fans knowing that their, that their head coach wasn't going to be there, maybe sort of accepted a loss in the beforehand, but, you have a Tampa Bay team that really didn't create a whole lot. They get two goals from three shots on target, but they didn't really create a whole lot outside of that. This is not the same kind of Tampa Bay team. It was a nice defensive performance from Memphis, but I'm also willing to say that it was more chalked up to lack of creativity for Tampa Bay. And then Memphis, they can score goals for fun. They have one of the most fun attacking teams in the league. They have some of the most talent and it's really impressive with what they have and them being able to create like crazy wants a little bit of a shock against Tampa Bay. It's also Memphis. They have that sort of talent just ready to them. Nothing like, uh, the world freezing up as we're trying to talk about things, but now you're, you're on a good roll. When you look at Nikki law and what he's been able to do there in Tampa, how, how would you break down what, what Nikki has been able to do taking over for Neil? I know it's a different vibe and getting adjusted to players and things like that, but what do you, what's been your takeaways with Nikki as head coach, leaving hunt city as a player coach in uh, MLS next pro with Jack Collison and now heading to Tampa. Yeah. I mean, Well, you know, kind of with what I was saying before, everything just decided to freeze up. (laughs) Um, You know, like Nicky has brought, Nick Law has brought in a lot of stability. He's a guy that's done the Neil Collins thing. He played under Neil Collins. So it's a bit of a continuity um, that happens there. And, you know, Neil Collins was there for a really long time. And there's a bit of a continuity there. And there hasn't been a massive change in system per se. Yeah. That said, I mean, this is a team that's as steady as ever. You could probably say, well, the defense isn't holding up like you want it to. I mean, example, this Memphis game. But like I was also saying before, you know, like I said, the world decided to freeze. Yeah, right. um, yeah, like Memphis can score goals for fun. They have that kind of attacking system. So it's not like it's a downright bad. In all reality, as much as we don't want to talk about it, it is a little bit of a world of Jimmy, Jimmy's and Joe's, right? 
you can as long as you can maintain the same system that Neil put out there, which Nikki Law has done with a couple of tweaks, obviously. Yeah. But you still have the superior talent, which Tampa Bay does. It's you're going to be all right. And yeah, this is not the best time to get a loss, but also they were doing so well before it. Obviously, they want to get as high on the table and maybe snag that top spot if they can. But also, all you need is that home playoff game, and you have your playoff chances rolling. They got a match in hand right now with uh, Screaming Bob Lilly and the Pittsburgh Riverhounds. And the funny thing about the East is that right now with playoff pursuits, it's three separate groups. Yep. You've got Pittsburgh, Tampa, Charleston. Mm -hmm. And Pittsburgh and Tampa have clinched a postseason berth because of the math that's involved further down the table. You've got one, two, and three chasing after each other. You've got four, five, and six chasing after each other. And Loose City, 901, and Indy 11. Birmingham's got a bit of a buffer. They've lost two in a row. And then you have the chaos right now at eight, where Tulsa is at 32. Had a three-game losing streak come at the worst possible time, but they've kind of they've shaken that off with a win. Detroit City at 31, and not a Miami FC, but the Miami FC right now in 10th at 29 points. So you've got these three groups chasing after all of this activity in the Eastern Conference. One through 10 still has stuff to play for. It's just the varying degrees. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned this East. It really is the top, and there are teams that you don't expect to be where they are. Like you talk about Loose City, right? They them being in fourth, and yeah, they're in play for a playoff game. But when's the last time you've really talked about Loose City being in fourth? Yeah. Um, Indy has all the talent in the world, got off to a horrendous start and has been red hot ever since. And you're really starting to see what this, what people have called basically the 2018 USL All Stars can do because guess what? They got that name because they're still really good. Um, meanwhile, my brain kind of sees it as Pittsburgh and Tampa, and Charleston's kind of on their own. Charleston may sneak into that second spot, but Charleston is more streaky and less consistent in yeah. my brain. That said, Charleston has the high end talent. And I mean, if you haven't heard and sang the praises of Fidel Barajas, I mean, he's ridiculous. And he's a 17 year old that can carry this team. And Augie Williams is going to get called up. And he already got called up. I can think the Sri Lanka again. Mm -hmm. You know, they have this international talent. But that's also kind of where it gets hard is. You have a lot of these players like Charleston. Charleston's littered with international talent. USL doesn't get an international break. So they're about to have a whole lot of players taken away, but they're also good enough to not fall into that lower tier. So Charleston's kind of by themselves. As for the carnage at the bottom, <laughs> Detroit City has one of the best, and I am willing to throw it out there and say the best defense in the USL. It is ridiculous how good they are. They give up more goals than you would expect from the best team, but this is also a team that – this whole year has not scored goals. They've been on the back foot all year long, and there's only so long that you can withstand them only averaging, I think like maybe 1.2 goals a game or even less than that. They've had a million of one nil losses. Yeah. It's ridiculous how good this back line is. And it's a continuity from last year. Where I don't think any of it's really changed. And Brett Levis joining has really made a big difference too. Tulsa, has cleared house. They got rid of all the fan favorites and they have brought in really talented players and it's worked out enough for them to get into these playoff spots. But with as strong of a team as they can put on the field, I don't think that's really where they want to be. As for Birmingham Legion, we talk about them a lot and obviously I'm a Legion fan. So like, don't get me too started, but they're just an enigma. <laughs> they're, they're an enigma with, you can say that they have one of the best rosters coming into this season. We talked about them. We consider them a top four team in the USL and it just hasn't worked. Mm -hmm. And all this carnage at the bottom is going to lead to a really fun into the season because somebody's heart's going to be broken on decision day. And I, I'm kind of excited. And also I don't think I can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> so what's, so then what is going on in Birmingham since you opened this door, let's go ahead and go through it. Uh, put your fan, put your fandom to the side. Yeah. I, 
I know that you're there. You you have you you've got your space at Protective. I know that you have your the Kaylor Hodges Memorial seat. Yeah, you know, row. But put put your fandom to the side. What has gone on this year? With I mean, you, you talk about streaky teams. I mean, Legion they've been world beaters, and then they can't tie their shoes for a month. Yeah. I mean, what's going on in Birmingham? Defense, and it all comes down to defense. And simply put, and I don't want to oversimplify it, you only have two center backs on the roster. And while they are two very good center backs, I'm willing to put Fanwell Cavita and Alice Cornelli with any center back pairing in the league. They haven't gotten a break. The only time that they have gotten breaks this year, and I'm not joking, the only time they have gotten breaks is through yellow card suspensions. Mm -hmm. That's been their only rest all year long. And a lot of these silly mistakes, these laps and judgments, um, I think there was a stat that was put out uh, by John Fuller not too long ago that of the of all like goals scored in the 75th minute plus in the USL, 10% of them have been conceded by Birmingham Legion. Wow. And these are players that are exhausted. Mm -hmm. And these like little laps and judgments are just tired. And I think that's what it is in the end is that players are getting tired. They're exhausted and they frankly keep signing wingers and not signing anyone else. I did the math on it for people who have appeared for Legion this year as a winger. There have been 12 players to have appeared as a winger for Birmingham Legion this year. You can make a starting 11 with a sub <laughs> with wingers on this team. There's only one striker on the team, Nico Brett. There's right. no other out and out forwards on the team. It's just not a very balanced roster construction. And I think they're really paying for it towards the end of the year. When you, you mention all of that, I mean, it's, it, the, the chaos that will happen. You mentioned international break, and I went to the list that was produced by uh, USL Championship. Yep. Uh, I'm just going to mention teams. Uh, Sacramento, Tampa Bay, Tulsa, Hartford, and, and Hartford really does need Benesto Mendez with where they are in the standings. Uh, El Paso, New Mexico United, the Miami FC, Roots, San Antonio, Sacramento, Switchbacks, Pittsburgh, Switchbacks, Pittsburgh, uh, let's see where we are. Who am I missing? Augie Williams with Charleston Battery. Yosiki with Monterey Bay. Uh, Oakland Roots with Neville Hackshaw. San Antonio again, Shannon Gomez. Ryan Telford, the Miami FC. Central Valley actually is losing a lot of folks in yep. one. But it looks like it's going to hit Sacramento hard, and it's going to hit Pittsburgh hard at the worst possible time for those teams. That said, they've also there were also teams that created enough of a buffer that they can survive that. And while they are some of the best players, you look at Sacramento and you look at uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Sacramento, and San Antonio are some of the best examples in the USL championship of plug and play. Mm -hmm. Like Bob Lilly, Mark Briggs, and um, uh, oh my gosh, I'm forgetting uh, San Antonio's coach's name now. I've talked about him a million times. Anyway, it doesn't matter. They have built these systems where they have brought in high end talent and they can do that but it's more system than player and we talk about jimmy i talked about jimmy's and joe's earlier that's tampa bay but and that's charleston but when you talk about pittsburgh sacramento and san antonio yes players are important bad players don't win games but system fixes it system can do it and i think those are teams that can survive it Alan Marcina is the answer to our trip. Alan Marcina. I was I was to have Marcina on the tongue, and I was like, <laughs> I don't think that's right. Oh, it was. You 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 had it. I was there. I was there. You, you mentioned the West, so let's get into the West here a little bit. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Sacramento, San Antonio, two points uh, separating them at one and two. Then there's gap space. Orange County's had a fantastic turnaround mm, over the yes. last like year and a half, really. After they were just at the bottom of the table, they were at the bottom of the table early this year, and they've hit the they've hit the gas pedal. They're they're in third, and they've won five, they've won their last five. Then you start to to get into that second grouping: San Diego, Phoenix, Oakland, and then you get into the chaos down at, at seven and eight with switchbacks at thirty six, locomotive at thirty five. That's your playoff bar. Locomotive have lost four and five at the worst possible time. Switchbacks have been drawn back into it, losing two in a row. Monterey Bay, another streaky team this year. You don't know which one of those you're going to get. They're right now below the playoff bar at 34. 
but they only have nine wins. They've got some work to do. New Mexico United at 33. Rio Grand Valley with Wilmer Cabrera is at 32. So four points, five teams, seven through 11. And I know that this is what the USL Championship wants, is that they want competition leading into that final weekend to try to make sure everything is still relevant. But the chaos we talk about in the East is the same kind of chaos we have in the West. Yeah, and it, was, it wasn't it was really this case. Oh, this was the case last year for the West. The West last year was all on the bottom was was just a grind, and the top had already submitted themselves as we're the best. We're probably going to win it all anyway. Um, you know, when you talk about those teams, if I were to put, put like power rankings of teams that I trust going into this, right? Right. Colorado Springs, they are an enigma and of themselves as well. They are another team that I I didn't believe. I didn't believe at all in them this year. And they've been better than expected, but then they just do nothing. They, and it really doesn't make sense either. Cause you watch the games and they're doing the same exact thing that they were doing when they scored three, but for some reason it's just not doing it. New Mexico is a team that I haven't believed in at all this year. They have talent. You look at the roster and you say, this should do something, but New Mexico and the Miami FC are the same team in my mind of, they can't until they make me believe I won't believe in them. They can't walk and chew gum at the same time. Yeah. Like I, I'm not going to believe in them until they show me that I can believe in them. Okay. When I looked at, when I look at RGV, they're a team that always makes their way into the playoffs. And I believe in the talent that they have there. I, why do I believe in RGV? I don't know. They just always seem to do it. They just seem to have the magic down Edinburgh. And when you look at El Paso, Something I said all year long with El Paso was I believed in their defense. I said this preseason that I believe in their defense. I believe in their starting forwards, but they have no depth in attack. If one of them gets hurt, they are screwed. And while they haven't been, they haven't been hurt. Those two, those like two forwards that I really believe in have been ice cold and they have no one else they can bring on. El Paso is a team when they're running hot can be top of the league, but they are they are streaky and they are as streaky as streaking can get. As for Monterey Bay, they are just I I believe in the back line, but the attack they can score at a prolific rate if they can get shots off. Sometimes that is their issue. They are just too selective, and then whenever they decide, hey, we've been too selective, they start shooting from forty yards out, and that's all they're taking all day long. And it's really frustrating to watch because in a weird way, I started having a love of Monterey Bay, like just an infatuation with them because yeah, they would score like they had like, I think a 40% conversion rate uh, through half of the season. It was like, how are you doing this? And it's because they would have some games where they wouldn't even put a shot on and it just made no sense. So they are, they are a team that confuses me. And this is the bottom of that West is just confusing because they can all be world leaders except for New Mexico and Colorado Springs. Um, and then the rest are just there. All right. So I haven't had the chance to ask you about this since it happened, but what has been the USL show's take on what has been going on in San Diego with the loyal not being able to find a home and uh this is the last season of the san diego loyal as we know it so one of our good friends alan underwood he has been on uh uh two balls and a mic um which is pretty much the leading soccer source in san diego and he is a mainstay on our show and it was hard we got our we did our first episode back And we weren't really sure how to tackle it because San Diego was one of the pillars of how to build a community club. You have clubs like Oakland, your uh, New Mexico's, your Detroit cities, and your San Diego's. Those four are the pinnacle in the championship of how to build a community led group. And there's a lot of talks about what happened with the venue stuff that, you know, if you ask someone closer to the source, maybe they'll talk to you about it, but not for me to say, but like for we, it's not as blunt as MLS ruined it, but also that that's a lot of the crux of the issue. And they didn't want to put out 
less of a product. They didn't want to, they didn't want to put out something worse. They didn't want to give a worse venue for the fans. And it, it's been really hard to see because loyal felt like a team that was going to be around for 50 years. And that was kind of all of our takes is that we're just, we're just sad. And it really shows just how finicky us soccer still is. We thought when Re, uh, Reno uh, shut down a couple years ago that that was going to be the last one because Reno was well attended and they were a good team. Yep. And we were like, it surely it can never happen again. Like we have gone past that point. And then San Diego happens. And this sounds absolutely horrible, but if it was Las Vegas, nobody would bat an eye. But this was this was San Diego. And I think it really – hit us that U.S. soccer is not there yet. It's not safe. It's still not a smart investment. And you look at, I mean, the end, uh, the uh, Andrew Vasiliadis went on uh, social media three and a half minutes and explained the situation and th- that they tried. Yes, feel free to hydrate. Yes, we, we need, we need, yeah, we, yeah, need yeah. we need guests hydrated. That's perfectly fine. I do it too. But I mean, and, and Andrew said that they went up and down the coast looking for a venue and they couldn't find one and so you know they're going to turn over the keys to the idea of a franchise back to usl championship and yep. we'll see what happens from there uh yeah i mean it it is the the nature of the economics right now of soccer and sadly san diego won't be a part of it in usl championship uh after this season so all right uh two things to wrap up your segment and as always, it is red light, yellow light, green light, and then we'll preview yep. the weekend and what folks need to be watching when it comes to the USL uh, and USL Championship specifically. Red light, yellow light, green light. Nico Moreno coming up uh, Thursdays with Nico. He'll be in Seattle, and he he does the same thing that we do with you. Red light. Who is your red light this week? Who's your yellow? Who's your green? Where do you want to start? What direction do you want to start? You want to build up or do you want to build down? How do you want to do it? I want to just go ahead and just build up. I want to be in a good mood, you know, going into <laughs> this as we leave. Okay. Um, I I don't want to be full on just so harsh. And I've said I think this was my red light before. Um, I am so out on New Mexico. <laughs> they are my strongest red light. Okay. I they have all the talent and they just cannot do it in front of still some of the best crowds that you'll see. And it, it just I think if it was another club that was kind of middling like New Mexico, I wouldn't bother me as much. But they are they are a club that is well attended and they have the resources, it feels like, and you just want it to be better. Red light for them. I think they're well out of the playoffs. I don't think they're going to sneak their way in unless they just get just red hot. But I, I don't see it. They haven't shown it to me this year. Okay. Uh, all right, so yellow light, and the way that we phrase yellow is it can either be a team going from red toward green, or it can be a team going from green toward red. How, what, who's your yellow light? My yellow light is going to be Detroit City going from red to green. Um, they are they are a team that recently they started figuring out how to the score, and it's for Detroit City with the carnage that is the bottom of the East. Uh, This sounds awful, but you can draw your way into the playoffs and Detroit city has the lineup to draw their way in. All they need is one goal. All you need to score is one goal and you can rely on your back line to at least get you a point. That's just kind of the nature of the way they're set up. And if Ben Morris can really keep what he's doing going, because he started off awfully and he's really starting to show what he was supposed to be doing when he was at Ipswich. And I think that this is a team that is going to start becoming a green and you do not want to play them in the playoffs. All right. So then who's left on your board for the other direction that we're staring at now? Um, I'm going to go over to Oakland. Okay. I know that they're sitting in sixth, but this is not really an Oakland per se, more or less a Paul Blanchett. Um if you haven't been keeping up, he's about to set the record for most shots stopped in a USL season with seven games to go. And he's ridiculous. And he's one of those guys. And this is one of those teams that they, they don't have the defense of Detroit city, but they have a goalkeeper that you can just ride. And then they have players that can score. And 
they are a team that always seems to do something in the playoffs. They never do nothing. And I think there's firmly going to be in the playoffs this year. And Oakland gets up and gets out for the playoffs and are just for their club in general. So I am green light on Oakland. I think they're going to ruin somebody's season. And Paul Blanchett is going to just is is going to be the frustration and nightmares of several clubs to come to, at the end of the season. We also got the news from Oakland that they're going to spend one more year at their current home as they work yep. a modular stadium uh, to get everything squared away for 2025. Okay, viewing habits for the weekend. What are your viewing habits when you're not staring at the other football, either high school or college, when it comes to USL? Um, well, when it comes to USL, like I'm – uh, I mean, I'm pretty much just only watch the USL. I mean, this week, there's a couple of good games that are going on. Honestly, the biggest games for me this week were already played. Um, and that was your, uh, what do they call it? Oh my gosh. North Carolina and uh, Omaha. Like that was a crazy <laughs> match. It was, it was. Um, the biggest match that I think I am really, really looking forward to is going to be your Tampa Bay Loose City. It's mm-hmm. going to be a fun one. This is a match that always goes crazy. Um, this is, of course, if my wife will let me watch because she is binging Gilmore Girls right now. So oh, wow. that's a that's a retro binge. Yeah. So she recently discovered that it was on Netflix, and so she's watching Gilmore Girls. So we're going to find out if I'm going to be able to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> As always, uh, hit the promo for me for the USL show with you and Morrissey and the and the, the merry band. This is. We have one more day to buy the USL show kit. There you go. So we have a kit that is out that is all based on the USL, essentially. So it has all the colors of the A-League, the Y-League, League 2, W-League, Super League, League 1, Championship, all the colors on it. It has the big protagonist logo in the middle, our logo, and then our other show kit season on the back. And the big reason why you should buy it, Especially, hey, this is soccer down here. We want to support soccer down here. 100% of pro, uh, proceeds, all of it, we are keeping zero of it, is going to South Georgia Tormenta and the Carter Payne Fund. Well done. So all of our all the money made from it is going to go straight to them as supporting local soccer and putting it into a memorial fund that we, that we are heavily invested in. So all of the money is going to be going straight down to Statesboro, and we want to help raise as much money as possible. All right, for those that want to watch, listen, and take a part of at the USL show on the 280 character app, how do they do it? Uh, find us at the USL show on Twitter. You can look up the USL show on YouTube and also on Twitch. We don't have a whole lot of Twitch interaction, so like, please start joining us on Twitch. There you go. So, yeah, uh, you can find us, same handle, the USL show. Find us anywhere. What he said, as always, my friend, it's great to have you and, and your merry band of uh, at the USL showers uh, coming on and, and breaking everything down as we head toward the end of the regular season. Obviously, regular season's over. After the regular season's over, we'll have you guys back on to talk about the playoffs. And you might be fairly regular through the playoffs as we That's continue fine. to roll things through. And we'll keep an eye on stuff with uh, the craziness in USL League One, which is always madness when it comes to who wants to be in the playoffs in usl league one and who wants to be at top everything's kind of compressing now hailstorm was there north carolina was there now they're all kind of jumping on top of each other and if you're on the outside looking in like one Knox and tormenta you got some work to do to get into the playoffs Kaylor, my friend thanks as always be safe on your friday covering high school football in the state of alabama we'll catch up soon my friend appreciate it